all these different books about being who you are is wonderful and we don't need to change who we are to fit in or feel like we belong. I really love um, a couple of these books on the far right. I Believe I Can, I Am Enough. Those are great books. The I Believe I Can, I actually have ready to go for my students to give to them at the end of the year. Um, I'd like to write them each a little note inside. And Hi everyone, I'm just gonna go back a little bit. Um, I'm Beth Pittman. I'm really sorry that you can't see my face. Unfortunately, um, my Mac is being difficult, but we're still gonna have a great session and we're gonna talk about a lot of great books. You'll be able to see the title and the picture of the book when I'm talking about it. I'm going to read a little bit from the books. Um, I'm so sorry you won't see the exact pages, but you will know what book I'm talking about and you can still get a really good feel um, if you think that this book might work for you in your classroom. So we're gonna talk a little bit today about teaching tolerance through read alouds. I'm just making sure, Rochelle, everyone can hear me, right? Looks like it. Perfect. Okay, you guys, a little bit about me. There's a picture of me. Um, I am currently a first grade teacher in Central California. Um, California is a big place. Um, if you know middle of California, Sacramento area-ish, I'm a little bit south of that. This is my 17th year of teaching. We're gonna finish up in six more days. I've taught at four different schools in four grades. I've had about seven different principals. I've taught at Title I sites and non-Title I sites. Um, I started my teaching career in second grade. I've done first grade, a one-two combo, kindergarten for a few years, and then I've been back in first grade for the last eight years. Bless all you kindergarten teachers. Um, I totally thought that was going to be the easiest thing when I moved from first grade down to kindergarten. Um, that was not the case. Um, I quickly learned that in kindergarten, that is where most kids learn everything about what school means, like recess time and carpet time and calendar time. So thank you for all those wonderful kindergarten teachers. This is my family right here, you guys. There's me, and on the far left is my boyfriend, Patrick. In the middle is our son, Taylor. He is currently attending college in Idaho. He is in his second year of college. Um, he turned 21 a few months ago. So we're starting to enjoy that empty nester life here at home. Um, my boyfriend is a nurse at a local hospital. So between nursing and teaching, um, I feel like we got the whole round of things here. I am proud to say that our son is attending college to be a high school history teacher. So I'm so proud of him. He was working on a couple different degrees, but he's decided to be a teacher. So yay for him. So let's get into the nitty gritty here. Why read alouds? Well, in my classroom, I like to read a story every day after lunch. Um, it doesn't always go with what we're learning that week. Um, we focus on that in a different area of the day. But I want my picture books to help my students know they aren't alone. I want them to have those confetti moments and see themselves in those books or their situation or their family. They want them to see kids that look like them, see families that look like theirs in their read alouds so that they can feel like, oh, that's like my life. This is this is normal. I don't have to feel like my family or my body type or my life is different from everyone else's. I like to have guest readers. Um, we haven't had a lot of guest readers lately due to the pandemic, but things are slowly getting back to normal where I live in California. So next school year, I'm really excited to invite guest readers back into the classroom. I always um, have my principal come in or vice principal, really anyone in your school. Lots of people love to volunteer to come in and read. The kids love listening to other people besides myself read to them. Um, my principal here from a little while ago, he's no longer at my site. And he would come in and read and the kids would have a great time. I've had parents sign up to read and come in during the month. I'm hoping we can get back to parents on campus um, to read to my students more often. I always give parents the choice of me providing a book 
or they can bring in a book themselves. I just ask them to tell me ahead of time. So of course I can make sure that it is appropriate for my class that year. So we're gonna talk about a few different main areas of books that I love to use in my classroom. And I always get asked, well, do you do these in a certain order? Do you read all the family books first and then move through different ones? I really don't. Um, I pretty much change out my read aloud bookshelf once a month. And so I always have like seasonal books in there. When it's the beginning of the year, back to school books, things like that. But I always put in a few books from all these different categories that I'm gonna share with you today on my bookshelf. So it's kind of all year long. Um, we're focusing on different things and sharing different stories. Of course, if a certain issue has arised and I feel like we need to read a certain story at a certain time, of course, I'll pull it out and read it. Of course, you can read books more than once. Um, Kids love to listen to stories more than once. And so that's totally fine if you need to do that too. So first we're gonna talk about families. In my classroom, of course, we talk about this a lot in the beginning of the year, about everybody's family is different and how everybody's family is special and wonderful. I would never not let my students share about their personal families and how who lives with them and maybe who lives separately and all those types of things. So I'm gonna share a, a couple different stories that you see here on the screen. Again, I apologize that you won't see the exact picture that I'm reading to you, but I'm gonna start with this, um, the book that's titled Families, Families, Families. And it's a book about animal families. The illustrations are really cute. And I really like this book because it talks a lot about the types of families um, that we have now. In my classroom, we have had, I've had students with every type of family situation you can think of. So I'm just gonna read a couple pages to you and tell you a funny story about this book. So we're reading families, families, families. It's all about animal families. So in the beginning of the book, it says some children have two dads, some have one mom, some children are adopted, some have stepsisters and brothers. And I really like that it talks about adoption. Not everyone, um, I teach first grade, so they don't always know what that means. So we can talk about that and what exactly it means when a family adopts. I'm gonna read you one more little page in this story about families, families, families. This shows a dog family and it says some children's parents are married. And then a little cat family that says some children's parents are not. And the other day I was actually reading this story and one of my students shouts out when I read the page about some children's parents are not, they shouted out, oh, that, that's like your son. And I was like, you're right. And someone was like, what does that mean? And, and they said, well, um, her son, his mom and dad, that's Miss Pittman and her boyfriend, they're not married. So his parents aren't married. Well, that started a good conversation in my classroom about, well, why aren't we married? And do we plan to get married? And if we plan to get married, can we do it at the school? And can they all be in the wedding? Um, so they had the wedding all planned out for us if we wanted to do that. So I really love that story, families, families, families. It's a great one to talk about different family situations. Um, I haven't been able to find a book yet that talks about foster families. I would love it if anybody knew a book that mentioned the word foster family. Um, I would love to get a book that includes that type of family as well. Okay, I'm going to share one more little bit of a book from you on this screen still called Entango Makes Three. And that's the true story about these cute little penguins and how they make their own family in a zoo. So it talks about here on one of the pages, it says two penguins in the penguins house were a little bit different. One was named Roy and the other was named Silo. Roy and Silo were both boys, but they did everything together. They bowed to each other and walked together and sang to each other and swam together. And it talks a little bit about how the other penguins are finding a mate to make a family. And Roy and Silo, had decided to become a family themselves. And then on this page, it says, Roy and Silo had no egg to sit and keep warm. They had no baby chick to feed and cuddle and love. Their nest was nice, but it was a little empty. They had built a nest like the other penguins, 
but an egg never came. So one of the zookeepers actually found an egg um, that needed to be cared for. So he decided to put it in the nest of Roy and Silo and see what happened. And just like all the other penguins, Roy and Silo loved on the egg and took care of the egg. And then one day it cracked and out came their very own baby. She had fuzzy white feathers and a funny black beak. Now Roy and Silo were fathers. We'll call her Tango. Um, Mr. Gramsci, that's the zookeeper, decided because it, it takes two to make a tango. And then it shows how they're caring for the baby, just like every other penguin couple in the zoo. And the very last page is this beautiful picture with the sun going down and the penguins on top of the rocks. And it says, at night, the three penguins returned to their nest. There, they snuggled together and like all the other penguins in the penguin house and all the other animals in the zoo and all the other families in the big city around them, they went to sleep. And I love that it shows that they are just like every other family um, in that story with Roy and Silo and Tango. And I love, I have a few other books on here about families. I'm not gonna read any more about families for you, but these are some other suggestions. If you have a great book that I haven't shared on the screen, I would love for you to type that in and share it with us later. I always do a little project with my kids in the beginning of the year about families. It always looks a little bit different. And I like to show them that when I, when we look at pictures of families, we don't always know exactly who's in these pictures. Is it two dads? Is it their uncle? Is it their mom? Is it a grandparent? And that all families can look different. So sometimes we draw and write about our family. Sometimes we do a little more in depth project. It just kind of depends on how things are going that year. And sometimes if families are able to help do a project at home or not. I do like them to bring in a picture of their family if they're able to. I use an app called Seesaw. So if families don't want to actually send in the photo, they can take a picture of it and send it to me. Um, and I'm happy to print it out and bring it in for the students. So the next um, area we're going to talk about is talking about race. And I'm going to tell one thing that I usually get this question a lot when um, I'm doing this presentation is do I ever have any um, parents or admin complain about books that I'm reading that maybe some people aren't comfortable with. And I've been really reaching out and trying to read more books lately in the last few years, and I've never had any parents call and complain and ask, why did you read that book? I don't want my child to learn about that. Though I have thought about what I would say if I did encounter that situation. Of course, I would always listen to the parent and hear them out. And I would kind of talk to them about, well, I read those books so that everyone in my classroom feels welcome. And they know that their situation is important as everybody else's. And if your child had a circumstance come up, that a book would help explain that to the rest of the class or make your child feel more comfortable, then I would do that too. But I haven't had anyone ever say to me, I didn't like that story that you read to my student or anything like that. But it's always good to be prepared and talk about, you know, the reasons why it's important to share all these different things. So here we go. I'm going to share the book at the top called Chocolate Me by Tay Diggs. He, I think that's how you say his name. He also has another really good book called Mixed Me. And that's a story um, about him being mixed of two different races. So the little chocolate me, and it has some super cute cupcakes on it. And it starts out with him, and he's like at a playground with some friends. And, oh, I'm sorry, actually it starts out at home on his stoop. Now where my kids live and me, we don't have houses with stoops, so we had to talk about what that meant. And it starts out with saying, sitting on my stoop when I was five, not like Timmy or Johnny or even Mark, though I wanted a name like theirs. And the next page says chocolate me and he's sitting on his stoop and he's a little bit sad. And then it shows him and the boys playing together. When we play, they'd say, look where your skin begins. It's brown like dirt. Does it hurt to wash off? And then he says chocolate me. And right away, kids are picking up on how they're not being kind towards him. 
They often stared at my hair. Why do you look scared? It's so poofy and big like a wig, not straight. Don't you hate to comb it? And then on the next page, it shows him obviously upset and sad. And he says, chocolate me. And it goes to the story. They're still saying unkind things to him about um, his skin, um, his nose, his hair. And he goes home to talk to his mom about it. And so he's talking with her and she says, look, she says, look in the mirror and love what you see. And he's holding a little shirt that says chocolate me. And he decides to think about it. And it says, hmm, I started to think about my face, my skin, my nose, my fro. And says, and what do you know? And he's made some cupcakes with his mom. And now he's taking them out to his friends. Along came Timmy, Johnny, and Mark, who suddenly didn't seem so smart. And I started to smile and smile and smile. It felt so good. I could taste it. Why? Because I am chocolate. So I really, really love that story. Um, one of my students one time said that they would not have shared the cupcakes with the kids that were being mean to them. And then we talked about, you know, being able to forgive people and to, you know, letting them know that even if they look different, they're still as wonderful. And hopefully we can forgive and share the cupcakes with them. Um, there's a book that I'm going to share one more for this one. And it's down in the bottom corner called The Color of Us a really really good book and it describes um, skin color based on different types of food which is really relatable to kids that they can think oh well I'm not sure what skin color I would call mine but maybe this book could help them so it's called the color of us and it's mostly about a little girl and her mom and the little girl loves to draw and paint and do art and it says my name is Lena I am seven I'm the color of cinnamon mom says she could eat me up and then it goes in here and she talks about all her different friends and there's really beautiful illustrations and it says my best friend joe jen lives close to the playground joe jen is the color of honey two streets over we meet my cousin kyle his skin is reddish reddish brown like leaves in fall and she describes a bunch of her friends. And then at the end, because she's such a wonderful artist, she has painted a picture of all of her friends and just says, at last my pictures are done and I've painted everyone. Look, mom, I say the color of us. I first received this book um, from Lakeshore. They sent it to me with a box full of goodies. And we were able to make these little paper dolls that all had different skin tones, different hair. And we were able to make a little paper doll that looked like each one of my students. And I just loved seeing them talk with each other and decide which um, paper doll that they identified with and all the fun that we had. And then we hung them up in the classroom all year to be able to see all the different colors of us. So let's keep going a little bit. And we're going to move to this category, LGBTQ. I'm still gathering books in this category. If you know of some great books that would fit into this category, I would love for you to share them with me because I'm, I would like to add a little bit more to my collection. So you can see some books on here. And I did read Entango Makes Three a little earlier. Of course, it works for many different areas. So I'm going to do Peanut Goes for the Gold, this cute little hamster up here at the, on the top of the book. Now, um, this is by Jonathan Van Ness, and I think he was on the show Queer Eye for the Straight Guy. I think that's what it is, yes. And so he wrote this book, it's adorable, and it's about Peanut, and it mostly focuses on pronouns, and that Peanut um, goes by them and they and their. So it starts out with Peanut, and it says Peanut has their own way of doing things. And then it shows Peanut in a field with some of his friends or their friends, and they're all rolling around the grass. And it says, sometimes people think Peanut's weird, but more often friends wind up joining in the fun. And it goes to the story and Peanut is doing a gymnastics routine and Peanut ends up messing up a little bit. 
but decides to keep going and turn the tumble into a big giant leap in the presentation. And so at the end of the story, it says, yep, yeah, Peanut just has their own way of doing things. And even if they're still learning how to tie their shoe because their shoe became untied in the routine and they had to figure out how they were gonna make that work in the show. I will tell you every time I read that story, somebody asks, is Peanut a boy or a girl? So we just quickly talk about, well, in this story, Peanut goes by them or they, and they're not really using the pronouns of he or she, girl or boy. And surprisingly, the kids are just like, oh, okay. And they move on. I feel like if we just give them a truthful explanation, short, long, whatever you feel is necessary, the kids are always so accepting and they're just looking for an answer. So that's a great book. Peanut Goes for the Gold. I absolutely love that book. Another book I was going to um, share with you in this category is called Neither. It's in the top corner of the screen here. I really love this book too. So it starts out with a blue bunny and a yellow bird. And it says, once upon a time, there were two kinds. This, which is the blue bunny, and that, which is the yellow bird. So there's just two kinds, and that was it. Until, and there's a green egg that's starting to hatch. So it's a different color than everything else. And the little bird comes out of the green egg and says, honk. And they say to the bird, what kind are you? And the little bird says, I'm both. And the blue bunnies and the yellow chicks say, you can't be both. You must be neither. I'm neither? So it goes through the story of how there was this and that. And then there's this green little bird, neither, who doesn't fit into the two main categories. So neither decides to fly off and look for a place um, where they can fit in better. And it lands into a place and there's this little cat butterfly flying around. And um, neither is saying, I'm from the land of this and that, but I'm neither. So I'm looking for somewhere else to fit in. And the cat bird said, well, this isn't somewhere else, but you'll fit in here. And neither says, where is here? And it's called the land of all. And it has a super cute picture of all these different types of animals and they're all playing together and hanging out. And at the end of the story, it says, once upon a time, there were many kinds, this and that, somewhat and whatnot, either very sort of just, rather a little, neither and both, and all were welcome which I really love this book because it's really showing that everyone is welcome, everyone fits in. You don't have to fit into a certain type of mold or type so that you can be who you are. So that is one of my favorite books to read. I really like um, Except When They Don't. It talks a lot about like gender stereotypes. It talks about uh, boys like to play with trucks and the color blue. Boys like to play football. And then it gets to a page that says, except when they don't. And it shows them doing something else that people might not typically think something boys do. And then the same with girls. Girls love to dress up. Girls love to go shopping, except when they don't. And you can even see on the book here that there's a girl dressed up in like football gear. And that's a really, really good book as well. Oh, someone is asking me to turn on the closed caption. Sure, let me just turn that on really quick. I'm so glad that you asked. Okay, let's go up here. Let me go out of this really quick so I can turn it on. Oh, it's right here. Got it. Okay, can someone let me know if that's working? I can see it on my screen. Rochelle, can, do you yes. see that on your screen? We see, huh? yes, thank you for doing it. Oh, no problem, I'm so glad somebody asked. 
On a side note, I've started turning on closed captioning for all the videos in my classroom. In our district, we're starting to learn about UDL, Universal Design for Learning. Um, and one thing they suggested was turn on closed captioning for videos and things. So I love that someone asked us to do that today. Um, my kids have loved doing that too. So Accept When You Don't is also a really good book. So the next category, I'm keeping an eye on our time too. Oh, we've got lots of time. Is Embracing Others. I wasn't exactly sure what to call this category. So I just said Embracing Others, where I have a bunch of different books that focus on um, different topics, whether it's a disability or death or um, The Invisible Boy, where he feels invisible. I don't have The Invisible Boy today. Um, I like to give this warning about that story. If you haven't read it, it's absolutely wonderful. But I will tell you that it's a tearjerker. I'm not one to um, want to show my emotions all that much. So I always tell people to read it first. It's about a little boy who feels invisible because he doesn't have friends and he doesn't fit in. And he is mostly in black and white in the book. But as the book goes on and he meets a friend and starts to feel included, um, he is more in color like the rest of the kids in the story. And it's such a sweet story and really hits home with kids to be on the lookout for others who might need friends and they just want to be part of the group. So one book I'm gonna share with you, it's at the bottom left of the screen, it's called My Brother Charlie. And this is also a true story. I'm written by Holly Robinson Peet. Um, she was an actress when I was a kid. And so it's about um, the little girl and her brother Charlie, they are twins. And the very first page says, we've always been together, even in mommy's tummy, my twin brother, Charlie and me. And it talks about how they've always played together and grown up together and some things um, they both like and some things they don't both like. And it talks about how mommy noticed that Charlie wasn't doing all the same things she was doing when she was younger. So I'll read this page to you and it's mom, and Charlie's sitting on her lap and they're at a doctor appointment. And it says, as we grew older, mommy watched Charlie very carefully. She and I could see he was struggling. Then mommy discovered that Charlie's brain works in a special way because he has autism. It's harder for Charlie to make friends or show his feelings or stay safe. One doctor even told mommy that Charlie would never say, I love you. That made mommy and me saddest of all. And it goes through the story about how they still play together and things like that. And one day um, the sister gets hurt and Charlie comes over to her. And this is what he says to her. Let me get to that page. Um, I'll always remember the first time I heard him say it. So clear and kind, so Charlie. I banged my toe hard and cried. There was my brother patting my back, saying over and over again, don't cry, Callie, I love you. And I just think that is the sweetest part of the book about how he's caring about her. Um, it may not look the same as everyone else, but he still cares about people. And then the last couple pages says, Charlie has autism, but autism doesn't have Charlie. If you ever get to meet my brother, you'll feel lucky to be his friend. You won't care if you have the coolest sneakers or if you are the best at sports. He'll just like you for who you are. That's Charlie. I'm blessed to be Charlie's sister and to share so much. I count my blessings every day. At the very top of my Charlie blessings is the love that Charlie and I have for each other. And I think this is a really good book. I've had many students in my classroom over the years who have autism. Some families are comfortable sharing with the class um, that their child has autism and some families are not. Um, I always make sure what they're comfortable with. Um, and we read these stories so kids can understand why maybe somebody does the things they do in the classroom. Um, one of my students this year has autism. So we talked about, just like it says in this book, that their brains work a little bit differently. And so they may need different things in the classroom like breaks, 
um, going outside to take a stretch, things like that. So My Brother Charlie is a great book. One more book in this area about embracing others that I wanted to share was called You Are Enough. And it says a book about inclusion. It is a little book about, I'm sorry, it is a book about a little girl with Down syndrome. And it's a true story. I'm just gonna read the introduction for you um, because I think it's it's so great to explain um, what the whole book is about. So, and this is a true story. It says, my name is Sophia Sanchez and I have Down syndrome. That means I look and learn differently than most people. I was born in a small town in Ukraine where I spent the first 16 months of my life in an orphanage. Um, and since Ukraine has been popular in the news and things lately, the kids had heard of that place before, so they had a little bit more of a connection. But in June 2010, my forever mom and dad took me home to the United States, where I live with them and my three older brothers. One of my brothers has Down syndrome too. I'm just like any other kid. I like to read and draw in my journal. I love people and making new friends. I dance and cheer. My favorite subjects are Spanish, music, and theater. My mom and dad are always taking pictures and videos of me. I love the camera. That's how I began my acting and modeling career. I'm only a kid, but I know someone who is happy, loving, and kind. I have Down syndrome and it makes some things harder for me, but it's just one part of who I am. I believe in myself and I want to inspire others to love themselves too, because we are all beautiful just as we are. And then the story just goes through how she needs to make friends and it was a little bit harder for her. And this is really the only book I've ever found before that talks about Down syndrome. Um, one of my good friends has the sweetest little girl. Her name is Charlotte. She also has Down syndrome. I gave her a copy of this book and her mom just loved it. She had her take it to school so her teacher could read it. Um, Charlotte is currently in the gen ed classroom. So they were loved that they were able to read this book to her friends and share a little bit more about her. A couple other books that I love on this screen, um, The I Miss You and The Invisible String are great books to talk about death. Um, if someone in their family has passed away, um, I think those books would be great if teachers were needing something to read about um, recent tragedies have come up. Of course, we are all um, devastated about the incident in Texas. Um, it made me think of those uh, sweet kids and teachers this morning when I was pulling out books for this presentation. Those are really good, simple books that talk about death. Um, Strictly No Elephants is fun and it's great about how you can be different and still fit in. This little boy wants to go to a pet party, but they tell me he can't come with this elephant because, um, for lack of better word, it's uh, back of lack of better word, it's a weird pet. So he finds a little girl in the park and she has a skunk for a pet and they decide to make their own pet club. Um, and it's on their sign, it's like, all pets are welcome. So that's a great one. Um, one more that I'll tell you about on this page, Hair Love at the top. Um, there's also a video of Hair Love on YouTube and it gets a little more in depth about the um, about what the book's about. And it's about a little girl who's trying to get her hair done and daddy's trying to help her and he's not very good at it. So they actually end up watching a YouTube video of mommy because mommy um, does hair videos and he helps her. And the book doesn't say cancer. And the video doesn't really either, but you can come to find out during the book and the video that mommy does have cancer, um, which I think is great. I actually invested in this book a couple of years ago when my sister-in-law was um, diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, she lost all of her hair. I bought this book for my nieces. It was really good and really great. So let's move on to the next category about names. Now, of course, names is something we focus on in the beginning of the year also. I'm a big stickler for saying the kids' names correctly. I tell the kids to not let me mispronounce it, that they might have to remind me a few times in the first week of school, um, but I'll I'm gonna figure it out. I'm gonna say it the same way your family does. If that means I need to write it down phonetically on a paper so I can remember, I make sure to include in subplans too. Um, if I include the phonetic spelling too, if there are names that I think the sub 
would not be familiar with. So these are all some really great books on here. I'm gonna share just one with you. It's called The Name Jar. Um, you can see that little girl at the bottom. Her name is Unhe, and she's got a jar and on the jar is a bunch of different names. Now, I will tell you that this book is pretty lengthy. It has lots of words. So I think with younger kids, you might need to break it up in the day or a couple of days um, because they might get a little restless listening to it. So this is a little girl named Unhe, and she has come from Korea. And when she goes to the bus, the kids are asking her name. And I'll just read a little bit to you because there's a lot on each page. And then someone says, are you new here? What's your name? A girl asked. Unhe, said Unhe. Unhe, the girl asked, scrunching her face. Ooh, 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 ni, the kids chanted. No, no, Unhe corrected. It's spelled U-N-H-E-I. It's pronounced Unhe. Oh, it's you, hey, the boy said, like, hey, you. And so we talk about with the kids about how that's hurtful. So she goes to the class and the teacher says, um, what is your name? And she says, oh, I, I haven't picked an American name yet. I'll let you know. So the kids all think this is great. And so in the jar, they're putting different names in there that they think she should call herself. And someone says um, like, oh, you should go by Allie. That's my middle name. Someone else says, oh, I really love the name Carrie. And so they put those names in there. And then one day the name jar goes missing and she's not sure why. But at the end, um, her she has a friend in the story. He's actually taken the name jar and he tells her, I took the name jar because I want you to keep your Korean name. I like that name. You should be proud of it too. So at the very end, she goes back to the class and she says, says Unhe wrote her name in both English and Korean on the chalkboard. And she tells the kids, I like the beautiful names and funny names you thought of for me, she told the class, but I realized I liked my own name best, so I chose it again. Korean names mean something. Unhe means grace. And I just love that it just talks about how wonderful everybody's name is. One of my students is Korean, and so she went home that night and had her mom help her write her name um, in Korean, which was amazing. She brought that in and got to share it. She's also part Japanese, so she wrote her name again in Japanese the next day. And we talked about kids' names and if they meant something. So I like to read this more in the beginning of the year and then sprinkle some of these other name books throughout the year. Our next category that I was gonna share with you is called Be You. All these different books about being who you are is wonderful and we don't need to change who we are to fit in or feel like we belong. I really love um, a couple of these books on the far right. I Believe I Can, I Am Enough. Those are great books. The I Believe I Can, I actually have ready to go for my students to give to them at the end of the year. Um, I'd like to write them each a little note inside and hand that to them as they head out on the last day of school. I'm gonna share with you this sweet story um, on the top left called Lulu is a Rhinoceros. So sweet about this little dog who, who feels and identifies as a rhinoceros. So let me read you a couple pages of that book. It's a super cute, I think it's a bulldog if I'm correct. Yes, I'm Lulu. What I am not is a bulldog. Yep, I was right, a bulldog. In fact, I'm not a dog at all. Can you guess what I am? I am a rhinoceros. And it shows Lulu looking in a mirror and it has a rhinoceros. And then of course, Lulu's with some other dogs and Lulu says, hi, I'm a rhinoceros. And this dog goes, eek. And she says, I'm a rhinoceros, this time to a poodle. Are you some kind of freak? And then to another dog, Lulu says, I'm a rhinoceros. And that dog says, do you think I can't see? And then she says again, I'm a rhinoceros. You don't look like one to me. And it says, in my heart, I have thick gray rhino skin. What I, what I really have is soft fuzzy fur. In my mind, I have a tail that whips and twirls. But what I see is a little nub that wiggles when I'm happy. But the only thing I don't have yet that I really want is my rhino horn. 
So the story goes on about how she can find a rhino horn and actually comes along comes along to some rhinos and there's all these birds flying around. And the bird is saying that you need me because every rhino has a tick bird. And that if you let me be with you, then you'll be a rhinoceros. And so Lulu says, well, I don't have a tick bird. And the tick bird says, well, if you need me, and Lulu says, if you need me, because the tick bird needs a rhinoceros, then why don't we? And they come together. So the last page shows a cute little tick bird on top of Lulu. And she says, yes, I am Lulu. I am a rhinoceros. And I think that that book could also fit into so many different categories. But I really like about being you and being proud of who you are. Okay, we just have a little bit more to go. Social emotional, we know, has been huge, especially in the last couple of years, um, especially when things like yesterday happened in Texas, where our hearts are broken and we just don't know what to say. Um, I didn't bring the book home, but right here in the top right, it's called Most People. This is a great book to read when things happen that we really just don't have the words for. Um, it talks about most people are good, most people are kind and do nice things. And one page that I really love talks about if you lined up all the good people in the world, the line would wrap all the way around the tallest mountain. And if you took all of the not kind people in the world, they would just fit into one building together, that there's so many more um, good people. So it just talks about that throughout the story that most people are good and to remember to look for those people when we feel like something bad has happened. I'm gonna share a couple pages from the book on the screen called Breathing Makes It Better. I'm um, in the beginning of the year in my classroom, we do a room transformation um, for, it's kind of like yoga themed, but it's more about working on your emotions. Um, so we talk about like a snow globe that our mind can sometimes be like a snow globe with the snow going all around and we need to get it back um, regulated and how we can help our emotions be like the snow and calm back down. So this is a beautiful book called Breathing Makes It Better. I'll just read you a couple of pages. Starts out with saying you are alive and because you are alive, you have feelings and emotions just like every person on earth. Sometimes you feel happy, silly, joyful, and calm. And sometimes you feel sad, angry, scared, and alone, and it can be uncomfortable. And it goes through a bunch of different feelings. It says, but if you watch and really notice, feelings come and go, just like your breath goes in and out in each little moment of the day. So it shows this little girl, and she has her toy bunny, and the arm has broken off. And it says, when your morning starts out terrible, and your heart feels hurt and broken, stop, take a breath. When I am sad, be still, be here. I shine warm and bright like the sun full of light. Breathe in, breathe out, peace is near. So it just goes through that through the whole story. It talks about different emotions and how we can breathe in, breathe out, and peace is near. And I like um, talking with my students a lot that emotions are okay. All of them that we feel are totally fine. We need to um, work on how we express those emotions, especially some of our sweet friends who have really, really big emotions. And those big emotions can sometimes lead um, to big feelings or sometimes throwing things or screaming. And I always work with my students that those emotions are okay. We're just gonna work on how to let them out a little bit better. Um, I have like a calm down box and all those different things in my classroom. Um, I'm looking at the time. I'm going to share two more books with you. One on this screen called Isle of You. It's on the bottom left. It is this beautifully illustrated book. And it's really good about when we're having a hard time emotionally. So it starts out with this child sitting in bed, um, hugging their pillow really tight. And it's nighttime, but they're not sleeping. And it says, was today a hard day? Are you feeling sad, lonely? maybe even a little angry. I'm sorry, come with me. I know the perfect place to go. It's there, just across the bay, can you see it? 
the Isle of You. And this page shows what you can see on the screen, um, the castle, and it looks like some hot air balloons. And so it shows this place where she goes and has all the things that she likes, music and soft noises and friends that are there. And it's talking about, as the story goes, it, it's not a real place. It's a place you can go in your head when you're having those feelings. And at the very end of the story, it says, it's time to say your goodbyes, but don't worry. You can come back whenever you'd like. And the next time you're feeling sad, remember, Isle of You. And on the last page, it shows the little girl finally sleeping in her bed. And it's good that we talk with kids that, you know, when we're having those hard times, just like when we think of go to our happy place, that's a real thing to help us relax and think about something that makes us feel better to help us get out of that tough emotion. The last category that I wanted to share with you is traditions slash celebrations. I'm working on gathering more books in this category as well. Um, in my classroom, I always have kids from many different backgrounds, cultures, they celebrate different holidays. Um, Ramadan is something that just passed recently and one of my students and his family celebrated that. So he loved to tell us about Ramadan and the different moons and then how they celebrated Eid um, at the end. The one book I wanted to share with you um, before we wrap up is called No Turkey for Thanksgiving. It is called something different um, in an older copy. I can't quite remember. Duck for Thanksgiving is maybe what it's called. Um, but anyways, the cute little girl in the front, her name is Tuyet. And her teacher is telling them, oh, have a great um, Thanksgiving, have a great turkey day. And she keeps telling her mom, we're supposed to have turkey. That's what people eat on Thanksgiving. And she says, no, we're gonna have um, duck. That's what we eat. So she goes to her Thanksgiving with her family and has a wonderful time with family, cousins, grandparents, they cook a bunch of wonderful food. She has a great time. And then she goes back to school and that's when she's feeling nervous. So let me read you a couple pages from this. The picture is the kids sitting on the carpet in a circle and the teacher is talking to them. And it says on Monday morning, Mrs. Cook gathered the class on the story rug. How was your turkey day? She asked. Tuyet raised her hand. My grandpa came, we played football. I'm sorry, not to yet. Tyler said that. That's nice, Mrs. Cook said. Who else saw grandparents? To yet raised her hand with her classmates. Who saw cousins? Mrs. Cook asked. To yet raised her hand again. Who'd like to talk about their dinner? In the next page, you can see that Tuya is really worried about that because she knows that her dinner was different from what her teacher was talking about. Mrs. Cook looked around the room. Tuya put her hand down. Tears burned her eyes. Is something wrong? Miss Cook asked gently. We didn't have turkey, Tuya blurted out. We had duck. And then on the next page, it shows all these different kids and they have some thought bubbles. And in their thought bubble is um, different foods that they ate. For a few moments, the class was silent, then Fong raised his hand. We didn't have turkey either. We had noodles and chicken. We had lamb, Tariq said. We had roast beef, Jonathan said. We had enchiladas, Carolina said. We had tofu turkey, Amy said. And then the teacher says, it doesn't matter what you eat on Thanksgiving as long as you had a good time with family and friends. So I really like to include my students' um, cultures and backgrounds and different things that they might celebrate. I would love if you had any recommendations for this category. Um, I would love to add some more books to my library. One more thing I wanted to share with you guys um, with read alouds. These are just a couple things that I use in my classroom. We all know books are expensive. A lot of times you can find these stories on the app books. Um, they call themselves the Netflix of storybooks that come alive and they're animated so that's a great place to look for books also epic is a wonderful place to find books online they have so many different titles in there so if you're ever looking um, for a book to help you with a certain situation i always suggest finding a place where you could get it for free first um, also youtube you can usually find a read aloud of most books out there that would help um, now I'm dating myself a little bit by showing these DVDs on the left here. I do still have a DVD player in my classroom. I love these ones from Scholastic. They're super cheap on Amazon. They're like $4 a piece. And they have a bunch of different stories in little movies. They're animated. So I love in the beginning of first grade, I like to do the back to school tales 
um, because where I teach, my, my students go to half day kindergarten. So they come to first grade and think that we're going home at lunchtime, but they're not. They have a few more hours to still stay. So we usually watch a story at um, towards the end of the day. So here's just some other ways you can find books um, instead of spending a lot of money at one time. I gathered a lot of my books also through Scholastic with points or through a donor's choose. And I just wanted to thank you guys for coming. Again, I apologize that the webcam wasn't working, but I still hope you were able to get a little bit of a sense of the different books that I shared with you. Um, I'd love you to connect with me. I'm mostly on Instagram, Inflexible and First. If you thought of a book like, oh, Beth, you totally need this book in your classroom, I'd love for you to shoot me a message. Um, and share that book with me, or if you had any more questions or you think of something tomorrow, and I would love for you to message me. I do check my messages, and I'd love to connect with you. Good night, everybody. Bye.